anemia, anorexia, loss of appetite, anxiety, apathy, brittle nails, cognitive impairment, cold hands and feet, the sensitivity to cold, constipation, delusions, depression, diarrhea, disorientation, dizziness, eczema, edema, fatigue, hallucinations, headache, hyperactivity, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, immunodepression, impotence, male infertility, insomnia, irritability, kidney stones, <laughs> restless leg syndrome, that's uh, muscle cramping in the legs, the lethargy, poor memory, mental confusion, muscle cramps, muscle pain, muscle spasm, muscle tension, muscle tremor, muscle weakness, nausea, nervousness, numbness of limbs, palpitations, paranoia, paresthesia, periodontal disease, that's gum disease, mouth disease, startle reflex, tooth decay, vertigo, that's dizziness, and slow wound healing. And when I'd also like to point out that on this list, some of these would be only indicated or associated with one mineral deficiency, but on this list, there are two conditions that are associated with all four deficiencies. And they are depression and hyperactivity. So what I would say, I'm not a physician, although I am a medical scientist, I study and I teach medical sciences, is that if somebody has any of these, the most reasonable thing to do from a medical point of view is first to restore adequate mineral nutrition and then consider using drugs. Because the antidepressant drugs given for this depression up here do not contain calcium, iron, magnesium, or zinc. I, I hope the point is well made. So what you're doing, you're studying minerals, you're learning how to use minerals, that this is a very important, very significant medical approach. It's a new medical approach based on new medical science from the past 20 years, and I am certain that it will be the foundation of medicine in the future. So the next thing I want to get into, and this certainly affects Asian agriculture as much as it does North American agriculture, and this is the problem of mineral depletion in the soil. If you start out with a plot of land, let's say there's forest or jungle, and you clear that land and you plant a crop, that soil is full of minerals, has all the minerals in it. It has all 22 essential minerals are in that soil. So a crop grows out of that soil and that plant draws those minerals up into it and that plant is wonderful, complete, whole mineral supplement. And this is what human beings ate for two million years. <laughs> they ate whole wild foods or animals that grazed on or ate whole wild foods. And as a result, for the two million years of our evolution, we had rich, full, adequate mineral supplementation. Now, about 10,000 years ago, out of two million, that's just a little moment as long as there have been people around, that people started settling and growing crops. And they very soon found out a phenomenon. If you take this plot of land and you, you grow it, you pull the minerals out of the soil and you take the crop away, well, you're removing those minerals. There's no way for them to get back. Right? You've taken them out of the system. So every year you take a few more out and it's a rule of thumb in agriculture that the average plot of land will grow a crop for 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, it will no longer support a crop because you have removed the minerals from the soil and the plants won't grow anymore. Or they won't grow uh, to a significant size or they won't bear fruit or something. They, they cease their yield after about 10 years. Now, some soils will be more and some plants will be more and some will be less. But what has happened to that food during that 10 years? In the first year, that food provided a good source of minerals. And every year in that food, there was less minerals in that food. The ear of broccoli may have looked just like broccoli. The, the broccoli may have looked just like broccoli. It looked exactly the same for 10 years. But in the 10th year, the broccoli had less minerals in it than it did in the first year because the soil was depleted. The way a modern agriculture has solved the problem of declining crop yields after 10 years, they don't want to have to leave. They want to put something in the soil 
so that the plants will grow big. So they put a fertilizer in the soil, and the fertilizer is called, well, let me put this next overhead up. These are plant nutrients. Uh, plant requires hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, uh, mostly in the form of oxygen and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, from the, from the air. And then uh, the plant's most important nutrients, the primary nutrients that it builds its structure out of, are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now the chemical name for that, the chemical letters for that in English are N for nitrogen, P for phosphorus, and K for potassium. The other nutrients they may need, magnesium, calcium, sulfur, and then the trace elements down here. What they found, industrially produced fertilizer, NPK fertilizer. This is the most common fertilizer used throughout the world. If you put nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus back in that soil, the soil doesn't die after 10 years. In fact, it can go on a long time, generations. You just put in nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus in there every year. The net effect, however, is every crop that you take out of the ground, just like our 10 years of broccoli there, each one was becoming more depleted, every year you're taking 22 essential minerals out of the soil and you put three back in. So coming back to our broccoli, after 10 years of fertilization with NPK fertilizer, the first year maybe you have the adequate nutrition and as the years go by you maintain the nitrogen, the potassium and the phosphorus but the other ones disappear. The other nutrients decline or disappear over that time because you're not putting them back in the soil. The result in which I'll show shortly in a series of tables is that over the past 30 years they call this the green revolution all across Asia, all across third world countries and the United States they started just producing billions of tons of nitrogen, potassium, NPK fertilizer, and that this has fueled not only agricultural revolution across Asia and around the world, but it's also fueled the population explosion. That because of increased crop yields from this, the population has expanded in those countries beyond the limits, some of the poor countries like Bangladesh, beyond the limits where it would normally be contained by starvation. This year, in uh, 1997, in the fall, there was an article in Scientific American magazine about uh, NPK fertilizer. And the scientists estimated that it has been used now to such an extent that if you took the whole human race and you looked at all the phosphorus molecules that are now contained in the whole human race, one out of five of those would have come from NPK fertilizer. Uh, an astonishing statistic. That's very good that we can have more people now, but for every, every phosphorus molecule that's there in the human race, that implies that these are not there when they used to be there. The broccoli in the later years looks like broccoli in the early years, right? But the stuff isn't in there. And human beings in the 1990s look like human beings did in the 1890s, but we're minerally deficient now because our agricultural soils have become depleted. Let's go back just to 1970. And this is in the United States, but a similar pattern is around the world. This is the rate of expenditures on a fertilizer, NPK fertilizer, over a 24-year period. It looks like it went up by a factor of four on United States farms in a 24-year period. Went from, this is in billions of dollars, 2.4 billions of dollars spent on fertilizer in 1970, 9.2 spent in 1994. And this agricultural shift in our generation is basically with a method that basically strips the minerals from the soil and from the food supply. This next uh, series of tables are from my book, The Healing Power of Minerals. This is a sampling of the tables. I did extensive research. I have a whole chapter there showing the changing amount of minerals in, in foods. And to do this, I relied on information from the United States Department of Agriculture. This is not radical information. This is official U.S. government information. And to do this, I had to dig up an old book. And I did manage to get a hold of a 1963 edition of the United States Department of Agriculture nutrient tables telling the nutritional composition of foods. And I compared that to their 1997 data that's, that's on the database. And we'll 